Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm glad to introduce Anthony here. Anthony is a PhD student from Department of Stats, Yale University. Uh, today we'll be talking about achieving information theoretical limits in higher dimensional regression. Anthony? Well, yeah, so thank you, Denny. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, as, you, as you said, that uh, my talk is on achieving information theoretical limits in high dimensional regression. Uh, so, before I uh, uh, talk about in these information theoretic limits and how we go about achieving it, uh, let me uh, talk about the general framework of high dimensional re uh, regression and give you a bit uh, some examples uh, just to uh, get you motivated. Uh, so, I'm sure that mm, almost all of you must be familiar with this. So you have a linear model, uh, y is equal to x beta plus epsilon, where the difference between this and the classical linear model is that the number of columns is typically much larger than the number of rows. So in this case, the number of columns is the sample size, uh, sorry, the number of columns is the dimension. It's typically much uh, larger than the number of rows, which is the sample size. So under this assumption, if you want to say something meaningful about beta, you need a sparsity assumption on it. So the most common uh, sparsity assumption is that beta has got, say, L non-zero entries, where L is typically uh, much smaller than the dimension. Yeah, please. Why does the assumption has to be sparsity, or could it be any other strong prior assumption? Yeah, so sparsity, yeah, I mean, you could have other assumptions also, right? For, for example, uh, the uh, the beta is con contained in a certain L1 ball or something like that. Yes, definitely. But this is the most common assumption. And the talk, I'm, uh, you know, my talk is going to focus on this assumption and, you know, information theoretical limits in, in this assumption. Yes, you're right. So, uh, so perhaps under this assumption, the most, uh, an important problem would be feature selection would be, that would be recovering the, the position of the non-zeros in beta, right? And this has been an area of a uh, lot of active interest nowadays. Uh, so for example, it's got applications in biology, uh, where you're uh, identifying the locations in a gene responsible for a disease, uh, graphical model selection, where you want to estimate a sparse graph, which also is like sparse coherence matrix estimation, and compressed sensing, where you have to recover a signal from relatively small measurements. Um, so before uh, I start the main part of my talk, let me talk about two examples that I came across recently. One is this example in uh, face recognition. Uh, in this, the, the situation is that you've got a number of people. So here we have got 10,000 people. And you have got a number of images of each person. So for example, the first person, he's, uh, she's got uh, 16 images. And the second person has got 12 images. And these, different, uh, these images are actually different. Uh, they vary in uh, light illumination and you know, gestures of the person. And the goal of this uh, face recognition device is to, you know, when a person comes in front of the device, to uh, detect whether that person is there in the database. And if he is there, detect which person it is. So this can be formulated as a high dimensional regression problem. So in this case, the X matrix would be, each, each column of the X matrix would correspond to an image of the person. So for example, the first person would have you know, 16 columns, second person would have nine, uh, 12 columns, etc. cetera. And uh, if a person stands in front of the uh, device, it's like providing the device with the Y variable. And the assumption is that you have got a sparse linear combination of the columns of the X matrix. So since this, uh, it's, this, this image is, is of the second person, but it's not exactly the same. It's probably differing in certain aspects. So you'd expect that this is, would be a sparse linear, a linear combination of the columns in the, you know, corresponding to the second person. So yeah, this is one example. Uh, another example that I, I actually found recent uh, in, interest, uh, I just found this recently, is this uh, method of out, output coding for multi-label prediction. 
the reason I bring this up is because uh, the problem, so I, I, I got started uh, being interested in high dimension regression because of the coding problem, which, which I'll tell you about shortly. And uh, this, this has got relations to that. So here, the scenario is that you've got a number of documents, say one, two, up to 1,000, where each document has got a few labels from a large label set. So let's say you've got a, a label set of uh, you know, 1,000 labels. And each document has got a few labels from that large uh, label set. So, uh, so this, these documents could be images also. Uh, like I think the paper, uh, their paper, they considered images from the ESP game data set. So this could be images also. And so, so for example, for, for document one, you have this large vector and with most of them zeros and with a one uh, when that label is present in the document, right? Now, uh, and the, uh, so, so the training data con consists of these label vectors along with you know, other explanatory variables for these documents. Now, uh, because this label vector is really uh, large, um, this, uh, you know, it may not be a good idea to fit uh, a model directly to these label vectors. So what they do is that these, they encode these label vectors. So here beta is the label vector by multiplying it by matrix A of say uh, random Gaussian entries to get a much lower dimensional vector Y. And then instead of fitting the model to this huge label vector, you fit it to this Y vector, which is much lower dimension. And then when you have got a new document, you try predict them, predicting the Y, y vector first and then use a reconstruction algorithm to get the original label vectors back. So this is one uh, advantage of, uh, you know, so this, this, this would, wouldn't be a good idea when the labels have a certain hierarchy. I mean, uh, but um, if you only know that there's just the sparsity and nothing else, then this might be a, a good idea. And in fact, uh, there are ways of, you know, if there is, a, if you know something more about the sparsity, like the sparsity appears in groups, you can, you know, include that in the reconstruction algorithm. So these are examples of high dimensional regression. The the questions that I was interested in was the relationships between sample size, dimension, sparsity, and signal to noise ratio for accurate feature selection. And two. Uh, the nature in which the above changes when one allows for a small number of mistakes. Uh, when, what I mean by mistakes is both uh, false alarms and fail detections. So false positives and fa uh, uh, false negatives. So uh, actually this is important because it might be the case that uh, under the sparsity assumption that I said that there are a few L non-zero entries, some of the non-zero entries may be relatively small, right? So. Uh, putting the condition that you want to recover all of them, that, that may be too stringent a criterion. So you want to be more flexible, and then uh, you, you want to see how these relationships change uh, when you allow that flexibility. But I'll, I'll, uh, the, the main part of my talk would be uh, on this, the first part. Yeah, please go. Yeah, so signal to noise ratio is actually the, uh, uh, I define it as the, you can define it as the norm of x beta, the L2 norm. So I, I, that will become clear in my context soon. Yeah, thanks. So, so, so let me uh, give you the outline of my talk. So I'll first talk about information theoretic limits of sparse recovery. And then I'll, I'll talk about uh, this communication problem, which uh, I'll describe only briefly. But this was the main reason I got interested in the information theoretic limits. And then I'll uh, provide a discussion of practical approaches, for example, uh, greedy algorithms for solving, uh, uh, you know, discussing uh, how close to these information theoretic limits uh, uh, existing practical approaches get. And then third, I'll, I'll discuss uh, the performance of an iterative algorithm uh, that we propose uh, and along with a, a little bit about the theoretical analysis, actually demonstrating that one can get these information theoretic limits. So, so let, me, let me start 
about talking uh, about information theoretic limits of sparse recovery. So assume that you have a, uh, this linear model and uh, assume that the entries of x are id with say variance 1 and epsilon has got id normal 0 1 entries. So the normal 0 1 is, uh, I mean ideally it would be a normal 0 sigma but that's just a scaling. So let's just assume that it's a normal 0 1 entries. And uh, like I said, the beta, uh, the coefficient vector is sparse. So more specifically, you assume that uh, the coefficient vector belongs to a set uh, A, where A is the set of beta with L non-zeros, and with the non-zeros having magnitude at least W. So they have a, the non-zeros have a certain minimum magnitude. So, so it, it has to have exactly L zeros, L, L non-zeros, yeah. and all of them. Of right. Yeah, yeah of, of a magnitude w, right? Right. So, so. You're assuming that everything is ideal. Yeah, yeah. So. Every individual variable. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah. So the thing is that here we are worried about uh, information theoretic limits. So, so more specifically, we are interested in you know lower bounds on the sample size n to uh, detect the non-zeros of any beta in A, right? Now, uh, you're right that uh, uh, this is a strong assumption, but this lower bound would uh, hold for, you know, a broad class of matrices. So, in fact, if it cannot hold for, uh, you know, ID matrices are perhaps the best kind of matrices that you can get. I mean, for which you can get, you can get recovery with the lowest sample size possible. So, so I, yeah. Yeah, The problem would be um, feature selection is, is kind of an ill posed problem. The problem would be, for example, in biology, assume that you have two features which are simply identical. Right. Would you recognize both of them or one of them? Yeah, then you would be doing a, a, a one, a, you know, taking a linear combination of, uh, you know, them. Or... Yeah, but, but it, it might just pick one of them, it might be just take the combination of two. Right, right, right. Could happen. right. So, yeah, so, yeah, so in real life data set, you, uh, like, as you were saying, that you don't have this ID assumption. So in this case, so if, when, they, when they're ID, this, this thing wouldn't happen, right, when those two features would be identical. So, yes, but, yeah, you're, you're right. Real life data sets, you typically don't have that scenario. Okay. So, um, so, so the question is that how do we arrive at a, such a lower bound or what is a lower bound, right? So what, what statisticians do in such a case of trying to find a lower bound, you know, for uh, support recovery uh, for the set A is that they try to reduce this problem to a testing problem. So what do I mean? So you consider the set A star, which is a subset of A, which is set of beta in A, with non-zero values having equal to W. So beta, uh, beta the beta vector looks like that. And you know, there are L, L non-zero entries, right? And uh, so each of the non-zero entries have a value W. So the cardinality of A star is N choose L. And an algorithm that can detect elements in A can also detect elements in A star, simply because of the fact that A star is a subset of A, right? A is a much larger set, right? So the advantage uh, of uh, doing this is that we are kind of converting this original problem of trying to recover in the set A to a testing problem. So an algorithm that uh, uh, you know, has to detect in the set A star is basically doing a test, right? It has to test between which of these n choose L possibilities of beta it has to select, right? Or, or, or rather, it's doing a classification kind of. So, and the advantage of reducing it to a testing problem is that there are information theoretic inequalities that gives lower bounds on the probability of error in testing problems. So, what do I mean? Um, yeah. So, it's not necessarily true that if you solve for A star, you're going to have the same set of non zero components in A, right? If you optimize for the full A, you may get a different set of, I mean, it may, it may fit better by choosing some of these to be zero and others to be larger than W. Uh, or is it true? 
So, uh, you guarantee if you solve this for the sub problem, the mm -hmm. x problem, and you find a certain set of non zero values. Right, right. And then you went and solved some magic, some magic box, the full problem. Mm -hmm. Are you guaranteed to get the same set of non zero values? Not, not the same values, but the same set of non zero values. The same features of non zero values. No, so. There's a lower bound. It's a lower yeah, so, bound. so the thing is that uh, here, what, what, so what I'm saying is that a lower bound for detecting in the set A star would be a lower bound for detecting in the set A because detecting in the set A is a, is a tougher problem. So, but you're right. I mean, you cannot uh, automatically, you know, generalize from A star to A. But uh, since we are worried about the lower bound, to provide a lower bound on A star would uh, also be a lower bound for the much larger set A. What's that? You're not trying to solve the problem. Just right, the right, problem. right, right. Yeah. So, so uh, as I said, there are information theory limits, uh, inequalities providing lower bounds in the probability of error. So what do I mean? So uh, the signal to noise ratio you can define here since uh, uh, the entries of X are ID with variance one, the signal to noise ratio is simply the norm of this vector beta squared, uh, the norm of this vector beta, the square norm of that. So in this case is L times W squared, right? And an important quantity that appears in these lower bounds is this quantity uh, known as the capacity, which is half log 1 plus SNR. And so how does this change if you uh, if the errors are non-unit uh, variants? So, so if the errors are non-unit variants, they would be uh, divided by the variance of the errors, right? Yeah. Th that's why, since that's a scaling, I just took it to be unit variance. So, so the lower bound on the sample size for uh, uh, detection in A star is, is actually a con consequence of a very famous theorem in uh, coding, which is the Shannon's coding theorem. And it's, it's not really meant for regression problems, but it can be readily applied to our uh, situation. So it basically says that to, a, to be able to detect any beta from A star, one requires n to be at least this quantity. It's log of the cardinality of A star divided by C. So, so let me write that down. Uh, n should be at least log of cardinality of A star divided by C, where C is so. So uh, since A star is, a, is actually a simpler problem than A, the same lower bound holds for detecting an A, right? But we are actually uh, interested in detection in the set A star, not A, uh, uh, for reasons I, I'll, I'll tell you soon enough. So let me just mention that the Shannon's theor coding theorem uh, was not meant to be used for, you know, for such applications. So there are stronger lower bounds on the sample size n have been recently proved specifically for this setup by these researchers. But these, these bounds agree with the Shannon lower bounds under the, under the setting that the sparsity over, over the dimension, which is L over capital N, is small. So in, in this regime, the Shannon lower bounds are still the strongest that is there. Slide. Yeah. Um, so, detect any beta from A star. Does that mean any of the set of betas or, or a particular beta you want to try and detect? So, any, any beta. So, any beta. right, yeah. I mean, any, any beta. And so, uh, so what, what this uh, theorem uh, actually says more specifically is that uh, suppose you have an algorithm that uh, is there for uh, some algorithm that you have for detection in A star. And that algorithm gives you an estimate beta hat, right? Now, what this says, what this theorem uh, sp says is that the probability that beta star, sorry, is not equal to the, uh, the average probability over all beta in A star This is, this is bounded away from zero if n is less than that quantity. So if the probability is bounded away from zero, then you cannot, yeah.
So, so the, the Shannon bound is still the strongest that you can get in this regime where the sparsity of dimension is small. But Shannon's bounds is a converse result. I mean, it, it need not be that you can get, I mean, so a converse result, so it's, it basically tells you what you cannot do, right? So it need not be that there can be an algorithm that can actually achieve these limits. So that means, what I mean by achieve is that, can one find a practical algorithm which can detect any element in A star with n near this quantity, log cardinality of A over C? Yeah, go ahead. So isn't the variance of the noise parameter in typical algorithms would be somewhat a controlled parameter? So you could play tricks with the bound by basically turning up or turning down the noise model that you were working with. No, no, no. So the noise, uh, the noise I, I said had is normal with variance one, right? Yeah, but but if you were, I mean, when one is actually solving the regression problem, they would often vary parameters that change the parameterization of noise. So you could choose to have higher noise or lower noise that you're modeling. Okay. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, but this covers everything. I mean, the lower bound is... Uh, but, but, but in the previous, sorry, but in the, in the equation you were saying you would scale the, in the previous one, where, where you had the, uh, the signal noise ratio. So that would scale with the noise variance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if the noise variance is, uh, is small, then the signal to noise ratio would be higher. And then you would require you know, the lower bound would be smaller, right? Okay. Yeah, so... So, so in other words, when you were modeling, if you do know that the, the actual variance of noise varies, the bound would just scale correspondingly... No, not yeah, it would be... Linearly or coded. Yeah, it, it would be like log of... Uh, so, SNR would be... So, in, in, in general, if there is a, a, a certain variance for the noise, the SNR would be the norm of beta squared, divided by the noise variance. Okay, so it would just come into the log into the bottom. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It would come in the log in the bottom. Yep. So can one actually find a practical algorithm that can detect elements in A star with n near this quantity? Yeah, go ahead. So since you described this model as a generative model, wouldn't the maximum posterior area be giving you this uh, Exactly this result that you're looking for. Uh, so, I'll I'll come uh, to the the map estimator soon, but uh, no, I mean uh, because this lower bound which I said that was that was that was a converse result. It was not meant. I mean, it's not like we took the maximum as epistory estimator and then saw you know how you know what the sample size was. It it was not done by analyzing any algorithm. It was just uh, some information theoretic limit inequalities for testing problems. So, but yes, we, we uh, that, that is the best estimator for this problem. And yes, we, that is also important to analyze that. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that soon. Yep. I actually still, I don't want to say that too much, I'll stop. But back to the, back to the fear of it, there must be, this, sorry. This one? Yeah, I mean, isn't that a probabilistic statement to it? You could detect a beta by chance with a, with a smaller n, right? So, but, uh, I mean, this probability would be, uh, I mean, this probability is overall beta. Right. Right? It's, it's not that you can. So, you might, even if your guess is 3, right. you have the odds of sometimes that right, right. the answer would be 3. But your probability of guessing right, regardless of what algorithm you will use, is bounded away from zero uh, by a constant. Okay. And this is what detection is. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, so that's the question. Uh, there's another way of re rephrasing this question. Uh, so, like I said, n should be at least that, and we want to see whether there's a practical procedure that can you know, make n close to that. I'll tell you why we, we, we are interested in, the, in that soon enough. So, uh, but there's another way of uh, uh, formulating this. If you define this quantity rate, which is log cardinality of A, rate R, which is the log cardinality of A star divided by n, by Shannon's theorem, uh, you need, I mean, this quantity rate cannot be greater than C, 
if you want to detect the elements in A star, right? So another way of uh, rephrasing this question is that devise a practical algorithm to detect elements in A star with R near C, right near this quantity capacity, right? So let me tell you why we are interested in this. I mean, uh, you know, detection near this set, uh, uh, near this uh, sample size and near log of A star O C. It's because of a, a, a communication problem which we formulate as a regression problem. So, so the communication problem is as follows. In communication, you want to send uh, messages reliably through a noisy medium, also known as a channel, right? Uh, so, so we assume that the set of messages is A star. So a message corresponds to a coefficient vector in A star. Now, there, there is a, there's a, quite a bit of story uh, that I'm hiding. Uh, it's, so when you're actually talking on a cell phone, you're not sending coefficient vectors, but you're actually speaking. But what's actually done is that uh, this time is divided into blocks. And then the, whatever you, you speak is digitized. And then digitized meaning converted into binary strings. And those binary strings are basically mapped into one of those coefficient vectors in A star. So that's, that's a story which can be there in the background. So let's just assume that the set of messages is A star. And I said uh, you transmit uh, through a noisy medium. Uh, so the noisy medium actually adds a normal 0, 1 noise to what is sent. So let me be more specific. Suppose a sender wants to transmit a vector beta in A star. Okay. Now what he does is that he encodes this beta using a matrix X of ID normal entries. So this is where the relationship with the multi-label uh, approach for, you know, uh, uh, coding approach for multi-label prediction comes in. So, so you encode beta to X beta. The receiver gets Y, which is a noisy version of X beta. So this is where the epsilon is the noise added by the medium. And since uh, we are assuming that the channel, which is the noisy medium, is a Gaussian channel, the noise is normal with the uh, you know, variance 1. The receiver's goal is to get the correct beta from A star from the knowledge of Y and X. So it's a regression problem. And the reason you want to minimize the sample size, you want to make the sample size as small as possible, is that you want to minimize the number of transmissions. And so, so the, way this, the way the sender transmits this X beta is that he first transposes the first entry of X beta, then the second entry, up to the nth entry. And you don't want the number of transmissions to be large, right? So you want to make this um, N as small as possible for that reason. So, so now let me discuss practical, uh, discuss feasible strat strategies for solving this problem. One feasible strategy would be greedy algorithms, uh, which, is, uh, which is the approach we take. So, so let me first say that the best estimator, as you said, was the map estimator, which is you find the, you find the beta in A star, which minimizes this norm right, y minus x beta, the L2 norm of that. This has the least average probability of error. By average probability of error, I mean precisely this. However, this is not computationally feasible because, you know, you, you can't do a manual search over all beta and A star, right, because the A star is, is a huge set. So, however, it's really important to analyze how this uh, estimated performs because like like you mentioned Shannon's theorem is a converse result how so it, it it tells you what you cannot do right so even though this lower bound is there it may be the case that there is no scheme let alone a practical scheme that with which you can achieve this lower bound right so it's for that reason it's important to analyze this estimator first because if this estimator performs badly, you cannot even hope that any practical scheme can perform well, right? And in, in our paper, we show that this estimator actually performs quite well. So we have a shot with practical schemes, right? 
So possible uh, complete. Yeah. Results. So this results show that the Shannon's bound is actually a tight bound. Right. right. Right, but but you see, this estimate is not completely feasible. So, yeah, no, no, but, but just in terms of right, that's right. It's a tight bound, right? So, possible completely feasible strategies. Uh, very famous, uh, uh, something that has received a lot of attention is L1 uh, penalized methods. We, like I said, we use the uh, uh, the technique of greedy approaches. So, so let me give you a bit more background on greedy approaches. So the way these algorithms work is that they select one term in a step, recomputes the fit, and repeats the process. That's the general high-level way these things work. So for example, one, one way of doing this would be you start with an initial fit of 0. You update the residual vector, which is, uh, which is y minus the fit in the previous step. You find the term jk that maximizes the inner product with residuals right you find the the uh, the feature that is max uh, which has the most correlation with the residual you update the fit using the selected term jk i'll tell you uh, you know ways you can update the fit soon i mean in the next slide and then you see whether a particular stopping criterion is met and uh, say a stopping criterion would be if this uh, norm of this residual vector is small or not that would be a stopping criterion. If it's not met, you do again. So ways you can update this fit. Well, if you, if you take this fit uh, uh, as uh, the new fit as a previous fit, plus uh, you know, the, the newly selected term xjk, but then the, the, the coefficient of that term would be the actual inner product, then you have the matching pursuit algorithm. If it's not exactly the inner product, but a small portion of that inner product, epsilon k is a small positive quantity, then you get the forward uh, stage-wise algorithm. And then if, you, if, you, if, you, if the new fit is actually a projection of y on the selected terms, then it's uh, this algorithm known as the orthogonal matching pursuit. And this, this, this is like a whole uh, host of algorithms that one can have, and in fact, uh, there is a whole host of ways you can fit, uh, you know, pick this next term. So, so that gives rise to a huge class of algorithms, and you know, such algorithms have been used, uh, you know, for neural nets, uh, L2 boosting, learning with structured uh, sparsity, learning in uh, reproducible kernel Hilbert spaces, and uh, feature selection, which is the thing that we are interested in. In fact, even I have done some work uh, on uh, of feature selection using the orthogonal matching pursuit algorithm. So, so the results from this literature do imply that a sample size of the order of n choose l, remember n choose l is the, the cardinality of the set A star, right? These do imply that a sample size of the order of n choose l, you can recover the position of the non-zeros for any beta in A star. See, for example, uh, these results do show that. However, we are interested of more in the constant. I mean, not just order of magnitude, but also the constant. I mean, you get that you can recover with n close to 1 over c, right? What are the constants in those The constant, the thing is that, yeah, they're they are pretty, uh, they don't really need to care about the constants there. So it's uh, it's... It could be 9, 10, it could be anything. I mean, it's, yeah, they, they, the, the reason is that uh, they were focused on generality of applications, right? We have a specific problem where we have got the X matrix is IID normal entries and the quotient vector has got, you know, this structure where the non-zeros are W. So the question is that can we leverage that to give more stronger results, right, than what is there existing in result, uh, current literature? So, so, so yeah. No, no question. But if you don't know what the C's are for those results, how do you know yours is stronger? But I just don't see. So, uh, no, I mean they. Uh, no, I mean they really don't. They say that uh, with n of some constant. They just don't go that far. They just go further. Yeah, we are, we are, So they don't really. 
they are quite hazy about what the constant is. Like they say, it's, you know, to the order of magnitude of something. But yeah, so. So let, let's just, uh, so let me describe the uh, our iterative algorithm. It's actually a variant of these, uh, it's a minor variant of these uh, greedy algorithms. So, so we have a situation like this where the non-zeros are w. So notice that uh, y is, if you, if you denote s as the set of columns where beta, the coefficient vector is non-zero, then y is w times the sum of the xj's for over j and s plus noise, right? So xj is correlated with y if and only if j belongs to s. Now for the first step, we consider the statistic z1j, which is the inner product of xj with y, divided by the norm of y. And the set of terms that are selected in the first step are those for which z1j are greater than a positive threshold tau. So I, I'll tell you what this positive threshold is soon. For the second step, we, we consider terms that are not selected in the first step, in, in previous steps. So, so these are for step, you know, greater than two. Uh, so any terms selected on previous steps are selected. There's no going back and, you know, changing that. From previous steps, you get these fit vectors, uh, where the fit vectors are, you know, the sum of the xj's over the set detected in that step times this uh, scalar quantity w. We compute the residual, calculate this inner product statistics. So it's the inner product with, of xj with this residual divided by the norm of residual. And then you select those for which are, uh, you know, are greater than some threshold. And stop when either you have got L terms selected or when there are no terms above threshold. Now, the, the thing about this algorithm is that we can, after some effort, want, uh, actually characterize the distribution of these statistics ZKJ. And the distribution of the statistics is as follows. For any J in S, recall that S is the, the set of uh, terms where beta is non-zero, right? For any J in S, ZKJ is bounded from below with high probability by shifted normal. These WKJs are uh, ID normal zero one random variables. For any JK, uh, J in S is a shifted normal. And for any J not in S, it's simply a noise vector, a normal zero one random variable. These mu Ks are, uh, these mean mu Ks are greater than zero and they increase with steps. So, so, it's this mean that gives you a way of discriminating between the correct and the wrong terms. So a, a little more detail. Uh, oh, uh, so one thing I would like to mention is that these results are non-asymptotic. So, uh, so that was where a lot of our effort went into because, you know, for the first step, it's actually easy to calculate the distribution of Z1J. It's not a big effort. But because of this, from the second step, because you know there are terms detected in the first step, there are lots of you know uh, dependencies that arise, and actually getting such a ca characterization required a lot of effort. What is L here? What's that? What is L? Oh, the sparsity, the number of non-zero terms. Right. So the error probability, uh, the error probability meaning the the probability with which this is satisfied is actually exponentially small in L. A, a little more details, uh, since I'm actually running out of time. Le let me just say how this threshold tau is selected. Since for any j not in S, uh, zkj are id normal 0, 1, right? And since there are n minus l wrong terms, and since the maximum of uh, you know n minus l normal random variables is roughly like square root 2 log n minus l, you like to put the threshold as that to minimize false positives, right? Uh, the mean mu k has this form, so it's a function of it's a function of the fraction of correct detections from up to the previous steps, where this function is actually an increasing function. So what this gives us is that the total fraction of uh, terms detected after step k has expectation lower bounded by g of q k minus one, where g is this function. It's uh, it's it's some function on zero one. So so the take-home measures from this is that 
let's say for r, the rate r, remember rate is log of cardinality of a divided by n. Suppose you take a rate of 0.45 times c and you take an SNR of 7. The function g looks like that. On 0, 1, it looks like that. And the way our algorithm, our, our theory predicts that our algorithm progresses is something like that. So the first point over here is a fraction of terms detected after the first step. You go like that, and the, uh, as the second point with the fraction of uh, terms detected after the second step, etc. And you keep going till this last point. So our theory predicts that you can actually get most of it, 95% of it correct, and with an error probability that is like 10 to the power minus 4. So this was with the rate of 0.45 times c. What if you try to increase the rate a bit more, say 0.55 times c? Then a function g looks like this. So now look, it's touching this y is equal to x line. So, so what our theory predicts this is, is that our algorithm actually just has to stop over there. So you actually make a lot of mistakes. At least our bound gives that you make you know, 85% mistakes. And the error probability is like 10 to the power minus 5. But that doesn't matter because you, you are already making a lot of mistakes. It turns out that the rate r can only be made as high as this quantity, half SNR over 1 plus SNR, in, this, in, the, in the setup that we are in and using our algorithm. And it's it, a little bit of algebra uh, can show you that this quantity is actually less than this capacity C. So you really cannot drive the rate high. Notice that R, R0 increases to half as SNR goes to infinity. And uh, so in an asymptotic regime, uh, a similar threshold of recovery was noticed for the lasso algorithm. So this is, a, you know, this is how we show that this threshold uh, you know, uh, is in, uh, for finite SNR. He, he, Wainwright noticed it as SNR, you know, tends to infinity. So, so but the thing is that we, we, we need rate to be made as high as capacity, but here, using our setup and using our algorithm, we can only make it as high as R0. So how do we reach as high as capacity? So what we do is that we, we assume N to be of the form L times B. And uh, we divide the co we consider coefficient vectors of this form. So it's divided into L sections where each section has got B terms. And there's exactly one non-zero in each section, right? And the sum of squares of the non-zeros is equal to the SNR. We consider coefficient vectors like that. And we take A star to be all, the all, all such vectors, right? The cardinality of A is a star now is b to the power l. Notice, notice now, using this modified a star, we need to again show that we can make the sample size as small as this. a star can be anything. It could be any finite set. All we need to do is that show that the sample size is, can be made as small as that. So the weights that we consider actually uh, are of this form. They, de they decrease exponentially and they flatten out. Now you run the algorithm on this modified A star. And if you do that, remember like previously I was showing that with rate as 0.55 times C, the algorithm was getting stuck. Now with this modified A star, if you run it, you can actually make the algorithm go, you know, uh, actually detect most of the terms correctly. And so the way this uh, algorithm progresses using this modified A star is that in the first step, since the weights were decreasing like that, the initial sections, they had a higher probability of detection. So the, on the x-axis, you have the section number. The initial sections had a higher probability of detection. And it you know, decreases, since the weight decreases uh, like that, the, the probability of detection decreases like that. And the probability of detection by the seventh step, it increases dramatically. By the 13th step, it's even more. And by the 19th step, which is the last step, almost all the sections have a high probability of detection. And this can be summarized in a theorem. If you fix uh, any rate less than CB, where this quantity CB tends to capacity for large P, 
then our result can be stated as follows. For any rate less than CB, one has that the fraction of mistakes is of order 1 over log P. So if B tends to uh, infinity, this, uh, this tends to 0. And the probability is exponentially small in L. This quantity delta is actually the difference of CB from R. So, so what this actually tells us is that in certain uh, sparsity regimes, it's actually possible to achieve information theory limits using a practical scheme, right? Using our greedy approach. And the error probability is exponentially small. And this is something that I didn't stress, but um, so the existing results on high dimensional regression, while they are more general in nature, the error probabilities are not exponentially small. And one of the reasons for that is that they, 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 they focus on exact recovery of the non-zero terms. And that, that is too stringent, stringent a criterion uh, you know, to, to have you know, recover all the non-zeros exactly. You, you cannot get the, your error probability that high as we can. Since we allow for a small number of mistakes, we can get our error probability to be really small. Yeah? Is there a way in sparsity if you have log sparsity? Would so, everything become really hard? So what is log sparsity? So basically, instead of a linear number, instead of the number of relevant terms being linear of the total number of uh, features, if the number of features you want to recover is log. So it, it, the reason I said, for example, a lot of problems, you will, people will kind of flood the feature space with various uh, transformations of, the, of some number the, of... The number of uh, non-zeros can be not be linear. It, can be, it, it needs to be sublinear. I mean, so... But you said you had the n equals lb, right? So if you have n equals something log of l, if instead of a linear dependence on l, you have a log dependence on l. Oh, if oh, you want to recover oh, okay, 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 features, okay, is, okay, okay. Log in the number of total I see, I see. Uh, so number of this thing is. I think it should still work. I mean, uh, yeah, I need to think about it a bit more. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see this in a pro. Yeah, I, I need to think about it a bit more. Thanks. Um, and so. This, this, uh, these results actually f uh, provide a theoretic approval uh, and practical communication scheme. Uh, so the reason why we are doing all this is that the communication schemes that are used nowadays, they, they perform very well empirically. But a theoretical uh, understanding of how they perform for any given rates are less than capacity is not known. And so by formulating this as a regression problem, we try to we are trying to not only give a practical scheme but also give a practical scheme that you know we can have some theoretical result of how it performs for any given rate less than capacity so so future work uh, you know analysis of soft decisions instead of hard decisions so here in each step we selected terms or didn't select a term right what if we made soft decisions and we we are pretty sure that uh, you know, this would uh, improve the algorithm significantly, but the question is that how do we analyze that theoretically? Implications for the general high dimensional regression problem, you know, like, so since we are, do these results actually carry over? You know, can we extend these results um, uh, over for the general high dimensional regression problem? Uh, other things that I'm interested in, learning with structure notions of sparsity, so when the sparsity is, you know, there's Something else other than the, the fact that there are L non-zeros, you know something more than that. And you know, I, I'm interested in working on other uh, problems in high dimensional statistics, uh, like matrix completion, high dimensional PCA, and dictionary learning. So with that, uh, thank you, and thank you for the time. Thank you. Yeah. I'm still puzzled by something very basic. OK, yeah, please. Um, the X, at the very beginning, you, you made the assumption that the X matrix the elements are IID. Right. And with variance 1. Right. By which I understood you to mean that each element of the matrix is IID with right. variance 1. You're not talking about the vectors being IID with, with the unique covariance matrix. Right. Well, the... now, if, if every variable is IID with variance is IID, why don't you just, why, does, why is the selection even interesting? Just take the first, first L of them. They can uh -huh. have the same, same behavior in predicting why is any other set of L of them. 
you see what I'm saying? If they're IID, right. then uh, the selection thing just seems like, why are you doing it in the first place? If they're IID, I just take the first element if that's what I want to do, if that's your assumption. Uh, no, so the, so the the thing is that we need to ensure selection not just for the first L. So yes, they're IID. So you have y is equal to x beta. And the, and the x is IID. Yeah. Beta is not IID. Yeah. So let, they are non-zero value w, right? In our case. Yeah, but the, that, that amounts to choosing a subset of the columns of x. So, no, we, we, so the thing is that you have to, uh, the, the algorithm should be such that it should guarantee selection for any subset of features selected, not just, so you don't know which the, the subset that was selected. The algorithm has to detect that no matter, so, I, so I, maybe I was, there's uh, a gold set beta, beta. Only, only the ones, the, the coefficients, for beta, only the so you're trying to find the beta hat. Yeah. yeah. Or, or you just find, find the subset of the column of x. X they are right. But they're, by choosing beta, you already fix those are the ones we need to yeah. detect. Your, the thing is just to detect those ones that have been chosen. Also, they're generated in the ID. Right, right. But, 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 so, so, but in a sense, if, if, if beta has a zero co coefficient, for example, in the yeah. first index, right then y is independent oh, of the first of column of x. But who cares? The first column is uh, distributed the same way as the second column. But if I'm doing kind of much regression, I'm giving, yeah. the, I'm giving the y. So you're trying to find something about beta, not about the x. Yeah, I understand. So yeah. the x? That's what's puzzling me. That's what's puzzling me. It's x is the coding matrix. Yeah. And beta is just the thing you're trying to recover from the signal you get y. The best way to understand this is from the coding the, the kind of coding communication problem that you, you set up. I think I was stuck on the regression. No yeah, I think yeah, it's, 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 misleading. <laughs> it's misleading to think about it as regression at uh, some level because it's really a decoding problem. Yeah, but yeah, you must yeah, think yeah. about it as regression as because it's a nat there's a natural way of thinking about it in that way. Yeah. So, right. so you're saying that it's, it's a, a practical, uh, probably a practical communication scheme. But, but basically, it's, it's still you, you kind of pre-decide how many you need to send, right? The read and then after as the receiver end you need to still solve this using the greedy algorithm to solve the recoveries. Uh, as your method is kind of greedy method. You also mentioned there's another type of method which is uh, based on that so based on that yeah, yeah. You, you, so do you know the, the performance of that algorithm? You know yeah so 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 the thing is that so the reason why we started working on this was uh, that existing communication schemes, they, they perform well in practice, but a theoretical understanding is not there. Yeah. So we, we needed to get somehow to demonstrate that a theoretical, a, a theoretical demonstration that an algorithm can achieve rates up to capacity. Now, the, for Lasso also, I'm pretty sure that under that setup, uh, it should perform, well, our algorithm empirically, it performs better than the Lasso, but as long as uh, the, the, the maximum rate you can achieve with Lasso, I'm pretty sure it must be the same. Okay. But how do you prove that theoretically? Okay, that's, you mean algorithmically performing issues? Right. I think it's bad they have the similar problems. But right. I, I, been, uh, yeah, so. Because I think in, in certain set, others, right. different setups, I think the result would be the, the Lasso solution would be slightly right. more better than the greedy algorithm. Right. So, but, but the thing here is that. In this greedy algorithm, we have made use of the fact that the non-zeros are W. Mm -hmm. And also, like, uh, so I, I told you that the statistics we used were based on inner products, right? But in our paper, it's actually a, a, a statistic that is close to that. It's, it's, that is our motivation for it, but the statistics that we analyze is actually close to that. So what I'm trying to say is that in our analysis and uh, of our algorithm, we, we try to make use uh, the most we can of this normal structure and the, the fact that the non uh, the the non zeros are W. The Lasso algorithm it's 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 a more general thing. So that's one reason why our algorithm performs better than the Lasso. Yeah. So what are the comparable techniques that work well in 
practice but don't have theoretical bounds. Oh, you mean used in communi yeah. communication nowadays? So the, 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 the technique that is used in communication uh, nowadays is, are these LDPC codes. They, they, have, um, they use belief propagation techniques. Now, belief propagation algorithms, they have got a good theoretical understanding. Uh, when the, uh, so these are algorithms on graphs. So, uh, I don't know much about the details, but the, there is a good theoretical understanding when these graphs are trees. But the, the graphs that they use while communication, they have, they're not trees, they have cycles in them. But they still use, use these algorithms and they work. But a theoretical understanding, there's, there's still a gap, except in some very special channels, uh, there is still no theoretical understanding of you know, how the codes that are used uh, nowadays in practice perform. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.